Okay. Uh, hi, everyone. Welcome to this session um, with Jerry Fadugba, um, a teaching assistant at the um, um, African Institute for Mathematical Sciences. And um, not, not going to waste too much time, but he, we've, we've, um, we've probably, probably have gone through the discussion to see the introduction, um, Jerry, and, and all of those things and what the session will entail. So I'm just going to leave Jerry to go on with the session so that uh, we can save a lot of your time and, and you gain the knowledge you want to gain and, uh, and go on. So today's session, of course, is going to be on classification algorithms. And Jerry is going to be talking to us about how these systems work. And um, anything, uh, we have lots of um, other links to other things in the show notes. So you can get some few items from, uh, from Amazon. We are an affiliate with Amazon to help support the community and help keep doing what we're doing and uh, for free. And um, any other thing you need uh, in the description, pretty much. So um, enjoy the session with Jerry. So there we go. All right. Um, hello, everyone. It's, it's nice to be here and I'm glad to have this session with, with you guys. And um, yeah, I hope and believe that you for my presentation today. Right, all right. So um, yeah, as, as he has introduced, I'm Jerry for short and um, basically working as a teaching assistant in the African Masters in Machine Intelligence at Ghana here and um, so over the past months, I've actually been lecturers and, and stuff from giving lectures and all that. So today we'll be looking at classification algorithms and quick look into why deep learning works. Right? And um, based on my understanding, uh, everyone already has some idea about what data science is, what machine learning means. And um, I know uh, last week we heard from our evangelist who, who actually took his time to delve more about classification algorithms. So I'm going to be, so this is going to be just very short, just to wrap up what evangelist got last week and um, probably talk about what we learned previously, especially when it comes to classification algorithms. All right. So uh, that will be the idea of what this um, session will be. All right, so um, yes, just the outline, look at the background on why, we, why machine learning is important, then we go to classification algorithms, then we focus on why deep learning works. So uh, this question, when you ask why deep learning works, it's, it's, it's a, I mean, it's a very theoretical question because it deals with a lot of things. So we won't focus on, yeah, we'll just focus more about intuition. Right, and then in and then we come to it. All right, so um, here we go. So here's the problem. Okay, so the problem statement here is, it, so the, a, a restaurant is trying to um, set up a system, an automated system that allows customers to order food without the need of calling the waitress, right? And uh, what this entails is they want the customers to uh, pen camera, something like that, and then you point the camera to the meal you're interested in. It takes a picture of it, and right, and uh, the server now classifies which menu you're interested in, right, and it sends it sends the menu and the menu details to the kitchen, right. So all so this is like so this is a big project job functions attached to it like the deployment like the software engineering behind it and all that yeah but about you as a machine learning person your, your task is just to build a classifier so that's so that's the idea of what this uh, project is all about right so how does it work it's like this right so firstly you take a picture right to, so you to check if the cap no or not you know so so this is so this is how typically uh uh the machine learning problem could be in the real life, right? So, you know, most times when you want to train your model, you probably just use one MS data and all that. But first you need to check, is this image, is it even uh, a menu first in the first instance, right? So let's say so there could be a mistake in capturing, right? And probably you capture the table instead of the menu. Right? So, these are, so these are some of the uh, issue cases that 
that is always attached to um, stuff like this. So first you need to check, right? Check if this image is even a menu or not. That's a binary model on its own. And then once it's once you've identified that it's a menu item, then you now check which. So and then you feed it. So your model now tries to classify uh, classify the image either it's a it's a spaghetti or it's pizza or whatever right so and then the information is sent to the key so this is a kind of like a typical uh, scenario of a machine learning of building a classifier in, in, in that in the real world right? and this is i mean this is not something just for me so this is something we actually build right so uh yeah so if you are looking for if you think as if uh, what exactly application? This is this is one application that I probably have not heard about. All right. So um, now we've have, you've heard the supervised learning and you have unsupervised learning and other way around. All right. So in the supervised learning, you basically have both uh, both the images and the labels. Now, what do I mean by that? So if I go back to this, right. So uh, consider the image, which which is the image is a menu, which which is a menu image, right? Now, I want to build an object classifier over it. So I need to train my, my model needs to know, okay. So let's say uh, I have the image of a spaghetti, but this side, I have to have the label spaghetti, right? Or whatever I mean. So, the, so that's what I mean by you have, you have a label alongside. Right, so that is in the supervised learning settings, right? And then on the unsupervised, you just, you don't have that. You don't have that label. Right, you just have the you just have the image, you just have the data without labels. So and in this case, this is about it. And these are algorithms you can use. You can use the PCA, you use a similar value decomposition, Kenny's clustering, and all that. All right, so uh, yeah, I failed to mention that in the in the supervised learning settings, you have to more or less have two types, right? You have the classification and you have the regression. In our case, it's a classification because uh, we are trying to uh, we are not we are trying to predict the label, right? So in in a in a in a regression case, you are trying to predict a real value. Okay, so um, other variants you have reinforcement learning, uh, which these more about agents and all that self-supervised learning. Now, so this is a very new frontiers, right? Um, the idea is that. Your, your data actually serves as the labels, right? So you can just look at it later on, self-supervised learning. And then you have the semi-supervised learning, which is more, like, more or less a combination of both supervised and unsupervised. You have, the, you have more labels for some data and then you, have, you don't have labels for other all all data. Right, so those are, those are uh, stuff related to that. Now, so, uh, in machine learning, right now, um, basically, it studies out to accurate predictions based on past observations, right? And um, what what do I mean by this? So you've you've done a lot of uh, if, if you are doing a repetitive task, right? So what machine learning does is to be able to learn observations um, and try to predict a new a new instance, and um, you know, I'm sure you probably you've seen some memes and jokes about um, machine learning's bunch of if statements. Well, it's not, right? So you have a lot of if, if statements in, in software engineering, right? So uh, ideally, so in this case now, it's a, machine learning is much more accurate than building a bunch of data and doing that. So, and uh, if you look at if you look at an example like this, so you have. So if you have a labeled example, so this your the labeled example here is is basically uh, my image, right? Your image and the, so that's so that, that is so that's what I mean by the labeled training example. And then this this machine learning uh, this machine learning algorithm is more or less uh, in this case now the supervised learning algorithm, right? And then you feed this to your to your model. So this is this is model. And then when you have a new when you have a new image, right? You pass this image to your model and then it gets you what you get to the class, right? So this is a typical classification learning algorithms. Right. So um let's look at 
let's look at examples of um, so let's look at applications of classification algorithms right so uh, like the one i showed in uh, application right uh, a menu scanner you want to scan the market segmentation right so uh, an advertising agent uh, did some promotions right and then you want to you want to actually segment the customers that respond to promotions right so that's an example of classification you you also have a kind of machine uh, vision face detection you probably want to build a face detection system to to um, to classify if this if this employee belongs to you or like works in this organization so let's say you build you build a system to to check like 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 sort of like a registrar remember if you go out if you go to some offices they use this fingerprint scanner and all that what well, things could change and it could be face detection so you could detect oh this face is jerry this face is uh, uh steven is a member of this organization and you allow the person in so that's a kind of classification algorithm then you have text categorization uh, categorization something like spam filtering where you want to classify if it's if this email is spam or not you know another example could be sentiment analysis uh, right you want you want to understand this the, the emotions in, in text or, um, so that so that's more or less like some applications of classification algorithms all right so uh we'll dive right straight into a classifier example so given this sort of like data that you have where you so you have this uh this place has the training data but and this is your and this is your test data right so in your training data you have you have your features as the sex the mask cape tie hair small class now the the problem statement here is you want to identify people as good or bad from their appearance you know they say um i don't know if there's this statement that say um the way you dress is the way they are dressed right yeah weird but anyways so that's so this is more of like a kind of scenario like that you want you want to do you want to you want to you know if this person is good or bad based on the way you dressed right so you have the you have the sex is a male or female mask let's put on the mask yes or no a tie here's a smoke so these are basically uh the kind of data that you could think about now one thing one of those algorithms you could think of is decision tree Oh, okay, I'm missing, I'm missing this. Yeah. So, um, so decision tree is is basically it's sort of like a, a tree that has like the foundations for most of the most most machine learning things related to SG boost, um, random forest, and all that. So, decision tree is one of the earliest classical machine learning algorithms. Yes, that does it. Person wears smokes. Yes, then it's bad uh tie then bad or tie uh let me just annotate it so that it makes it easy all right so you have tie so you have because go like this or go like this right so this is to know if this if this particular person right uh is good or bad so i mean these are so this is so this is more of like so it, you, you you sort of view like trees based on Based on based on the data that you have. Now, now the question you have is how do you build how do you build these trees? Well, so uh, it's basically three steps. One, one, you choose a rule split, right? So um, I'll come back to this. So there is you have a rule, and then the next step is you divide your data. If you, you, you define a rule, right? So in this place, if you've chosen the rule, you want to split your data, right? Now, at this space, you now divide your data based on these rules, All right? So once you've divided the data, you'll be having this joint subset. What, I mean, what do I mean by this joint subset means? So let's say, so you have a set like this, and you have a set like this, All right? So these are, these are, so this is a, this is subset A and this is subset B. They are, they are both disjointed, right? So typically in this case, what is trying to say, you have multiple of all this, All right? So. And then you 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 repeat recursively for each for each disjoint for each disjoint of set until until you have some sort of like purity. Okay. So now uh, the question that the question you actually want to ask is uh, 
how do you choose how do you choose a real split? Right. So um, ideally, most of the time, this this is this is actually this is actually done based on based on uh, domain understanding of the problem. Right. So you want to use Right, so you know, I actually want to go back to the data and, and try to you know, look at it good appearance. Right. So then you build you build your you build your room, you build your room based on that. Okay, so um I'll be stop I'll be stopping at some point just to all right. So um there is that. I'll, I'll, I'll come back and give you a summary more about this. So there are actually algorithms that you could use to build a decision tree for CRV, for classification, and regression trees, and then we have the C, C4.5. So they are the sort of like the best known algorithms we have in decision tree right now. And actually, it's relatively easy to interpret. It as a good thing. Uh, so it has this uh, good interpretability. And what do I mean by that is that you know once you once you've uh, once you have a new instance, right, and you pass your instance to, to, to your decision tree model, then you can see how did it make this decision, right? How did, how did it come up with, okay, yes, this person has a good appearance. Now, this person hasn't been in the training sample, right? But then you, you just brought it, you just brought it in, it's a very new, new instance into your model. Then you could plot, you could plot it and say, oh, okay, now I see. So a person has ties, smokes, okay, no wonder it classifies it as bad. Like you could see, you could see the, the, the reasons why it made this decision. So this is, so this, this is actually very, very good when you want to, when you want to interpret, you want to understand what goes on with your data. All right, so that's, so the CO2 is like one example of the classification algorithms. Uh, so just give me a break. <clears throat> All right, so um, logistic regression. So logistic regression is another example of a classification algorithm, right? And um, basically, it, it, it more or less stems from, from the binary classification. Of course, you can extend it to multi-class, right? But um, ideally, what this, what, what this does is to, is to create a kind of a linear, a linear, um, a line between your data. So let me let me just do some stuff here. Okay, so here you have here you have some points uh, different color. Right. So you have you have this right. So these are data points that I'm trying to draw here. And then you have you also have uh, another one, right? You have another one here. Yeah. Okay, so um, the basically logistic regression tries to look tries to look for that uh, for that good line, right? That tries to like classify it either. Um, like, like that tries to classify it to yellow and red, right? Classify your data point. So, that, so that's why I say binary classification. So um, now, one thing to one thing to understand here is that in logistic regression, one of the key assumptions is that your data is linearly separable, right? Um, don't mind my writing here. Right, so this is a very key as this is a very key assumption when when you're trying to when you're trying to use logistic regression. Right, so you need to first. So one of the reasons why I'm saying this is because uh, let's say you're giving your data now, you need to know it's your data linearly separable. And what I mean by linearly separable means that you could actually you could draw a line that separates the line that separates your data point into two, right, or into uh, what classes. So this is so this is uh, this is the this is the key this is a key assumption in logistic regression. Right, so we should uh, take note of that. Now, so you might want to ask, 
what if it's not linearly separable because your data could definitely not be linearly separable. Uh, so I could have something like this, right? And um, then you have this. Okay, and then you have you have another data point like this. Yeah, some data, so yeah, you could have data that, that, that actually looks like this. This is definitely the question you want to have this with linear uh, with logic regression um, work. Yes and no. Yes, yes because it's just gonna put a line, right? So it's, it could just, it could try to, it could try to say, oh, uh, here's, here's, the, here's, the, here's the line that's quite separate it, right? But then of course, we know that this, this doesn't separate it. So no, now means that I could now, I could do some engineering to this, right? And make sure that, my, my data is projected in such a way that it's linearly separable, right? So uh, I think I should have something like that. So but, but basically, so the intuition here is that uh, you actually use a sigmoid, use a sigmoid function like to, 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 uh, to categorize it that it belongs to one class or another class. So you use a sigmoid function. So um, yeah, so uh, I hope you understand that uh, I, Vangelis has actually done a lot of uh, tricks to this, but I'm just trying to give an update to what to all this. Okay, so now uh, one of the things one, how the learning is done in logistic regression is through is through gradient descent, right? Gradient descent. This is this is like this is like one of the this is one of the uh, this is the actual learning algorithm that comes into the space. So uh, this is more or less like a function, right? But then you're looking for a thing, looking for a parameters, looking for the set of parameters that that would allow this to be reduced, right? So you're looking for so this so this w you, you're trying to learn this w through gradient descent. The w here is the weight, right? Is like your, your your weight parameter, right? So and uh, to do that is great to say that let's just see how the data set works. All right, so gradient uh, descent is, is an optimization algorithm, right? And uh, what, it, what, it, what it does is, is to find the minimum of a convex cost function by taking its first order derivative. Right. Now, the question you ask is, what exactly is a convex function? So I uh, will go back to this. So you have you have this right now. Um, okay, what's wrong with me? Sorry, okay. So. Your function. So if you have a function that looks like this, this is a this is a convex function, right? So uh, gradient descent. What gradient descent is, is trying to do is to is to look for the minimum, right? So let's say, let's say our minimum is here. So this will, this would be so this is where so it takes some steps, small steps, small steps until it arrives at this at this. So that is that is the. Um, That is the idea. That is the idea behind um, the convex function. So, gradient descent is an optimization method that finds the minimum of a convex cost function, and it does that by taking its first order derivative. So, uh, what, what what are the steps? What are the steps to to doing gradient descent? First is it picks a random point on the error surface and calculates the gradient at that point. Right. Then you take a step towards the direction of opposite of the gradient, right? And then you have so ideally this is uh, so this is what you have, right? If you look at this, outside here could be could be same as W. 
your yeah, data here is the W that is in our loss functions. Right. Now, so once you pick a random point on the error surface, then you calculate you calculate the gradients, calculate the gradients at that point, right? And then you take a step towards the direction of opposite of the gradient. That's why you have a minus here, right? Now, so this is so this is just the gradient, and so your hectare here is the learning rate, right? This is a this is this is a learning rate. Now, one quick thing I just want to mention here is about the choice of your learning rate, right? Now, so if you have if you have this and then and then you have and then you have a cost function and you have a cost function like this, right? So if you pick a very large learning rate, right? So if you're so in our case we are using hectare is very large right so if your actor is very large then when you're taking the step you would most likely be oscillating right you most likely be coming back here coming back here coming back here coming back here you might definitely you might of course you might arrive at the minimum here but it might take long right and if you and if your um and if your actor is small right if your actor is very small Right. Then you'll be going just small, 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 small. So it will, it will, let's say, take longer time for you to converge to get your minimum, right? But if it's very large, then it's oscillate. So now, what, what are the, what are the, uh, let me say the um, tricks that you can use. So the tricks is the test for not too large learning rate and not too small, and then so so. Actually, learning rate is an hyperparameter. What I mean by hyperparameter is things you can set yourself. So, ideally, in practice, most of the time, what I do is you sort of like pick, you pick learning rate between sets of values, let's say 0 0.1, you pick a 0 0.05, or you pick 0 0.03, and other. Right? So, you could pick, or you could actually do it just a, a, a linear space, right? You could use, use Python just to get a uh, linear space between 0. Between 0 0.01 and 1, oh no, 0 0.9, right? So you could, so you can now uh, look for a good uh, learning rate for you. So that's so that's one trick that people actually, do. right? And so then back to the and then you this this stuff continues, right? It's an iterative process until you have until you have a global minimum, right? So that is so that's the idea about um, graded insert. I really hope this is clear. All right. So, ideally, in a uh, pseudo code, so what you could have, you could uh, you could have a function that first calculates the gradient, given your data and the and the loss functions. You could write a function that calculates the gradient. So, in uh, in this, remember you are looking for theta, so you could initialize your theta here, right? Initialize your theta randomly, then calculate the gradient, then do this continually. So you could. Number of iterations could be, uh, I mean, it's dependent. You could definitely set uh, 500 or so as substitute, or you could you could actually do something more like a, you, have a, you could have a stopping criterion. You could, you could do a four, you could do an infinite loop with, this, with a with a stopping criterion. It's all engineering choice there. All right, so. Um, Yeah, so, so that is that. So you could actually look at you could uh, look at uh, you could look at this this link later on. Oh, so I'm going to share the slide and uh, and you could, you could check this. You could, okay. So um, yeah, sorry for that. Uh, I don't know. I click this link and then it's just going off. So, uh, so I was more or less trying to uh, wrap up with graded descent, and uh, ideally this is this is sort of like the um, a kind of loop you can you can do just to do the gradient descent. So once you once you have, once you go to that, that is uh, basically it, right? Okay. So um, now the next the next thing is so okay. Just to wrap up to wrap up logistic regression. Now uh, we say we made an assumption that data has to be linear linearly separable for it to work. Well, so uh, remember I said yes and no when I asked the question, would logistic regression work if your data is 
not linearly separable? And I said yes and no. So in this case now, if, if you want your data to work, if you want your um, the logistic regression to work well, your data should be linearly separable. And if it's not linearly separable, then you could use method as this, um, kernel methods. So kernel methods are, are, are more of like um, a kind of feature engineering that you put, you, you, bring, your, you bring your model into, into a kind of space that it makes it linearly separable, right? So that is, that is, that is something we can do. We'll see we'll see this again in the in as we just right about now, right? And then uh, with so with gradient descent, you are definitely guaranteed to, to reach an optimal value. So now we've covered two different classification algorithms. One we'll look at decision trees, which is basically a tree based algorithm. Now we've looked at machine regression, which is more or less an optimization based uh, algorithm. And then another one we'll look at now is another linearly uh, linear model, work, which is called support vector machine. Now this is more, this is more or less like the de facto to many tasks. Even like the problem statements I shared, I started with of the menu scanner. Uh, so we actually used, so we are not, we are not using deep learning for that. <laughs> They're actually using support vector machine. All right. Surprisingly, it works well. Though we know that there's still some uh, problems, but so what vector machine the factors for classification algorithms. All right. And um, so the assumption, yes, also is that your data has to be linearly separable, right? Uh, and I think that that maximizes. The, the minimum margin, right? So in this case now, if you if you look at this, okay. So if if you look at this, so you have you have your you have your data, your red data here, and this. So these are these are these are uh, these are your data points. Now, and as I've mentioned earlier, linearly separable means that you could pass if you fill the line that separates the two together. Now, in this, in, in this case, support vector machines, we are actually looking for that uh, hyperplane, right? That, that maximizes the minimum margin, which means you're looking for, you're looking for the line so that, the, so that the distance between these places is maximized, right? So the distance between here and here is maximized. So once I once I'm able to have that once I'm able to have that line, then I can say, okay, yes, my, my S V box well. Right. Support vector machine. Right. We are looking for an hyperplane that maximizes the minimum margin. And the mass margin is the distance to the separated plane. So like to, this is so this is the margin. Right. Okay. Oftentimes, your data is not linearly separable, right? Like the, like the example below, oh, this is even, a, so this is actually a perfect example to what I was drawing earlier on, right? So you have, you have, you have this, uh, this, this stuff here, right? And then you have the, you have the outer, you have the outer. So these are actually data points. And ideally, these are kind of things that you see in, your, in, in, the, in the real life data, even much more worse than this. Right? And uh, so one thing you want to do is you want to, you want to you want to do support vector machine, but support vector machine assumes that your data has to be linearly separable. So, what can you do to make your data linearly separable? One thing you can do is the is the is feature engineering, which is which is more or less something like more or less this. So, this you have your x right. So then you can map. So you map your x to x one and x two. Right, which is not which which we could so you could use a you could do some kind of function, do more or less like a function, and right, and this this converts it to like one x one x two x, and this becomes linearly separable. So in the space in the map space, right, your data that was not linearly separable now becomes linearly separable. Right, so it's like so it's your feature space. Right, so this this. Um, So this, this, this features, these features that you have here that are not linearly separable, right? Then you can map them 
map them into this another space that makes them linearly separable. Right. And what one, one method to do that is is canals, right? Which is which is things like this. An example is the radial radial basis function, right? So you, you if you so if uh, later on I will share um, I'm going to share a collab notebook that will help you to do classification, right? With different uh, algorithms, right? So. Uh, you will see that in, in most of all these, for instance, they have uh, they have some parameters right, that, that helps you to decide which canal function you want to use. So radial basis function is actually one of one of such canals. All right. So to wrap up SVM. So SVM is very fast. It's a fast algorithm. So when 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 the dimension is not large, we take note. When the dimension is not large, its SVM is very fast. But when the dimension is large, like for instance, when we are working with the images, the dimension was very large, fast, right? And the, as I've said, it's more or less like the state of the art accuracy when it comes to classical ML. And uh, it also has a strong theoretical justification. This, this is very, very important to my theoretical justification. And just to, just to into you, deep learning doesn't have something like this, right? But SVM has this decision tree has it, um, logistic regression has it. So there's a strong statistical description to SVM. So that's why it's back to algorithms for people in industries, if not if not going for deep learning. And when I mean industries, I don't mean I mean like upcoming um, companies, not not big companies. Big guys. Because I'm not sure how do I don't know how they want to use SVM for for um, on the Facebook. So uh, so what's the problem with all this all the stuff that we that we made mention? So um, we've made mention about decision trees. We've made mention about um, logistic regression. We've made mention about so there are variants of orders. There are orders, right? So I just try to pick one or out of each kind of mental. So. For, for the tree based methods, you have both decision tree, you have random forest, you have um, XG boost, uh, all the gradient boosting algorithms, they, are, they fall under the tree based algorithms. But on, uh, on the linearly based ones, you have the support vector machines, you have the logistic regressions, you also have different ones. You also have a little more from probability side, nine base, and all that. So there are lots of classification algorithms, right? And uh, you will see, you will see them when, when, I, when I share. When I share the collab notebook uh, later on, you see all how we how, how you could actually even automate classification pipeline just to test out all these algorithms. Right, so there 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 are actually lots. But what is now the problem? It's all this classical classical ML, right? So we have right now we have lots of data. We have data, data, data. Like almost, I mean, from the internet you don't. There's a lot of and with this class. Is that it doesn't scale well with the, with, the, with the data that we have, right? So the performance either drops or it's, it plateaus. And what I'm wondering where that it's like so when you have so this is so this is your performance here and this is your data, right? So if you if you're doing this, so you do this, something like this. But in for classical ML, sorry, right? So for classical ML. Once the data, once the data starts getting increased, so it either drops, right? Either the performance drops or it just plateaus, tries to stay somewhere, right? But with deep learning, our, uh, our friend deep learning just decides to go like this, right? It just going. Its performance increases as your data increases, right? But anyways, we are we are not yet there at the deep learning. This is just to give you an instance of why. Classical ML fails in most most cases is because of the ever increasing data. Now another key one is the feature engineering, right? Now this is really a pain. This is coming up with engineered features, right? Some amazing features like like one of the issues I one of the reasons I gave earlier on, which is the kernel method, right? Uh, there is actually a bunch of people doing different different. Uh, doing some proofs and all that just to get the right kernel to use for this particular data 
So feature engineering was really a pain for most machine learning folks. Feature engineering was actually considered a sort of like a, a job function, right? Like, okay, uh, I have someone that will be building the model, you build me features, right? So these are, so this is, it, it's really one of the pain in the classical ML. Now, um, also another challenge with classical ML is that it's not transferable to new domains. Now, what do I mean by that? So in, in the deep learning, which you, which, which you will see later, you could have a model that is trained on multiple images and then you could transfer it to, to images. So let's say you train images on all the images, cats, dogs, trees, everything. And then, you, but you want to build a classification algorithm to classify, um, to classify, let's say, let's say, let's say uh, if to classify if a chest x ray has pneumonia or not. Right. Funny enough, if you train an algorithm on all these big, big, uh, all these large data sets that you have from the internet, it's transferred to new domains like, like the medical images. Right. Classical ML doesn't do that. You have to build your model based on the data. Right. And of course, performance is bad most of the time. So like the instance I gave earlier on about the problem we have, the performance is bad, right? With, 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 uh, with the normal class. These are the key pains and challenges that we have in the classical ML. So I will repeat, one, it doesn't scale well with the increasing data. It's always a pain to get the right feature. Performance is bad. And now, uh, here comes, So here is an instance. Here comes our, our, our big brother, deep learning. Now, so for for the for the example I gave you, for the example I gave Elena at the beginning about the main scanner, right? Now when we wanted to we actually have to uncraft some features, right? So you most sometimes they do things like this, right? So open has, open has a lot of uh, stuff that you can use to get features from images. So you have to so you have to uncraft features from from those from those images. Sometimes you also have to build what is called a dictionary. Right. So it's it's really a pain. But then when deep learning came, all this all this just gets taken away, right? All you just have to do is just to stack all these layers, right? Or you stack this, you stack this, put another one, put another one, put another one, put another one, and then it tries to classify it. Right. So this took away all the pains of trying to get the, the, the underlying principle here is that all these neurons, right, all these neurons here, lends some features from your images, right? That's why deep learning is more like, more like a, 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 um, a feature representation, right? So it's, it's, it lends the features for you and gives you a very good, very good representation at the last layer here, right? So, this is one of the, let me say, the great thing that has happened to the machine learning community. Deep learning came out. I mean, when it comes to images and text, it actually took a lot of things. So now consider this kind of example, right? This is from ImageNet. Now ImageNet is, is, is one of the big uh, data sets that you have on images, right? From various, from very degrees. It's all about 1,000 classes, and almost like millions of images. So the idea was that, uh, they want to train a system that is, they want to train a model that's able to recognize images, right? Now, take, take a look at these samples from ImageNet, right? Now you have this, you have this, you have this, you have this, you have this. Now, you can't, it's definitely going to be difficult for you to actually use this. Uh, it's going to be difficult for you to use this, right? Learn, to learn on, do, on those images. Right. It's, I mean, oh no. it's going to be difficult for you to use these handcrafted features, right? To learn on, um, to get the features from this from this kind of images, right? It's definitely going to. Be. And it actually does this automatically, automatically, which, 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 which was very, very great, right? And it's not just doing it for us. So. Deep learning actually took a lot of things. And also, where does it work, right? Now, as I said earlier on, it's very serious two questions. And uh, for people that are 
theoretically uh, inclined that people that want to actually more into the deep maths behind why deep learning works. Yeah, you could look at, take a look at some of these topics like the parameterization, generalization, optimization, and manifold, and this and this, right? So you could, why deep learning works is a very theoretical question. So uh, that is, that's not our focus. So deep learning actually came because of amazing, uh, amazing uh, things like the computer, it's a uh, open collaboration, huge investment, I mean, huge investment. And then you have this interdisciplinary co collaboration. So let's take them out. Now, so as I said earlier on with, 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 um, with all the classical MLs, right? So uh, classical MLs, they've, they've done decades of more than like 50 years of research in, in machine learning. So they've understood a lot of concepts, right? They've, they've understood what, or what uh, generalization means. They've they understood what, um, like from the probabilistic perspective, they understood what it means for a model to learn. Like, so they, 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 there is a lot of concepts in machine learning that has, that's actually it to, to, to survive. Right. So that is, that is, that is one, one key example. Another one is, so um, based on all the classical MLs, they've actually understood what optimization issues is and you know, large-scale algorithms. Large-scale algorithms meaning algorithms that can watch, work on large-scale data. Right. So all the, all the 50 years of machine learning before deep learning, they've understood all, this, all these issues. So it, it's, it became easy for deep learning to blow up so fast like that, right? And now we also have a clearer picture of fundamental issues like you know, to lower feet or under feet. You understood uh, bias, experience, dilemma. You also understood the generalization bond, which means like uh, how your model is able to generalize to new instances, right? So all these are, are, uh, are been settled because you have some, some long years of people working in machine learning, right? So, if you just see deep, someone just applying deep learning now and, and it's just achieving state of the arts, if you look deeper into it, tweak to one of the old classical techniques, right? This is one of the key things I've actually seen in, in, in this field, right? If there's, a, if there's a new things, let's say uh, on 3D, they actually took uh, clear cues from classical ML. So all this, so uh, the classical ML has actually given, the research is done, in classical ML has given a boost to deep learning that, that becomes the compute. So compute is actually one of the key things uh, in deep learning and um, not to scare you, but it, it's, it's also the it's disadvantage, right? Because now once they know that, okay, using more computes can give you good, good performance. Now those with the big money could actually just get lots of compute and get much more, much more uh, power over the data, much more, much more performance and accuracy, right? So like yesterday, yesterday there's a new model in town called uh, GPT-3, which is about something billion parameters and um, lots and lots and lots of compute. And it's actually, I, I mean, it's, that model could write, write a BuzzFeed article. So when you, when you have a model that generates lots of computer training to it. So computer resources was actually one of the, one of the things that, that helped deep learning to, you know, to, to grow so fast like this, right? So you also have the um, open collaboration tools. And um, yeah, I'm going very fast now. So we have this open source software. So you have the PyTorch, TensorFlow, Keras. All these are open source and it makes contributions much more easier. So people before, before uh, people were just keeping things to themselves. So um, there was no quick feedback, right? So if, if let's say as TensorFlow, TensorFlow, those that develop TensorFlow, Google, this internally earlier on, and I mean, there are lots of things that they couldn't fix until the open source date, and now they have TensorFlow 2.0. Open source, the open, the having open source software actually helped so also and it's the open collaboration, right? So people from different disciplines could test out deep learning algorithms and submit a paper to archive, right? And then they have the open review that gives quick feedback, right? So if you go to open review, you see a lot of papers there, you could actually comment 
about why this, why, why this is a good work or not, or critique the paper and all that. And also Reddit and Twitter. Well, Reddit and Twitter is social media, but truthfully, it's actually, I mean, I'm most likely always on Twitter because there's always something new that someone is posting. Right. So the, this, this collaboration actually helped Deep Learning to, to grow and keep expanding and breaking new ground. Uh, and then you have the open data. So Deep Learning is data hungry. It's looking for data all the time. And uh, so a lot of organizations, university labs, they actually open source some of their data and it helps other communities to actually uh, try to try out new, try out new ideas, test new hypotheses and, you know, also all these things are actually what make a lot of applications coming up that using deep learning. It's because this open collaboration. Now, so someone, so they, they are, I'll, based on this intro to deep learning, right, you, you understand that, okay, there are lots of things that you could actually do. So one is the object detection. Right, so object detection means like you have, so you have various objects like like this, and then you are, you're trying to detect what object is it, right? So this, so this is, so this is, this is an application of object, and it's one of the key, one of the key things used in in self in self driving cars. It's also one of the things used in the uh, you know, CCTV monitor. They, they are quite, they are quite a lot of, even it's actually using robotics object detection. So you want to detect objects. So you can do this with classical, right? It's definitely not possible to get good results and good accuracy. But deep learning came to make it possible for you to uh, generate features automatically if you have large data. And this became relatively easy. So Iman post estimation is another application, right? Um, so the so the idea of this is to is to, is, is to try to know what what sort of post a uh, person is doing. Right, paid applications which you might not go into, but my post estimation is actually one research that people are looking into. Even people are doing baby post estimation just to get new insights. Right, and it's very useful in in, in, in trying to uh, understand body movement and all that. So another key thing that came around when deep learning came was image generations. So this is one of my interests in machine learning. It's uh, it's Gantt, right? The idea is that you want to be able to you want to generate. So this is generating human faces. Now, if you look at this, you actually think these are these are these are people that exist somewhere. Well, I can tell you that they do not exist, right? This is all generated by deep learning algorithms, right? And um, you're wondering why does it why is it so good as this yeah i also i wondered the same thing and it's there are lots of you know there are actually lots of uh, great good things that you could do where you could generate an image first thing they can do is to um okay let me not let me not say that there are there are wide there are wide there are wide applications you could do with, with image generation so this is actually done via deep learning i mean definitely you can do this with you can do this with it's a classical learner. So you see, uh, deep learning actually took a lot of um, pains away and it, it breaks new barriers and, and stuff like that. All right, so another one is machine translation. So I'm running up now. This, so we've been talking really about images. So now this is step held in neural machine translation. I don't know. So if you, earlier on, people were using uh, some classical, techniques in NLP, right, to, to do this translation. When deep learning came, and a lot of people start, start trying out new things, so people tried testing it out on, on translations, and it actually gave, so, I mean, no one speaks French here, so I don't know, maybe if you speak French, you might probably understand if this translation was good, but I have some French speakers, and they say, yeah, this is, this is relatively what the translation looks like. So, is deep learning, is actually be, has been able to do this. And most of the translation systems you have on Google and all that, it's actually based on deep learning, all right? So what am I saying all this? Um, deep learning is very, it's something you should actually learn. Don't forget the classical learning, of course, but deep learning is also something you should have at, at your disposal to, 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 to have good graphs in, in, to work very well in national industry, in the industry. Right? You need to actually understand deep learning how to build it, code it up, and you know, 
do amazing things with it. So I think the last, and I'll be the last uh, application I'll be looking at is uh, is image captioning. So giving an image give us a short sentence or a short sentence about this image. So for example, looking at this, you can see the, the, the deep learning model predicts that a person riding a motorcycle on a dirt road, right? Now you'd be wondering why is this so perfect? Yeah, it's actually good, right? So you, another image is two dogs playing the grass, two hockey players learning generated text, right? Based on the image. So it, it takes an image and it captions it what it is. Of course, there are failures, right? So I'm just, this is just cherry picking some of the good things there. But there are failures, of course, but we should not, we should not be oblivious to the fact that this is actually working, right? And there's a lot of cool applications that you can do with it, even understanding that yes, there are, there are failures, right? But still, it's working, right? So um, to conclude, uh, I will just say that, of course, um, Whatever things that are done repeatedly, you can automate them. And also, on beyond even automation, now we've gone behind, we've gone to, towards generations, right? Like, uh, like generating new text, generating images, and all that. So, classical, and the truth is, classical ML are still side deep learning success. Uh, just like I told you about the problem uh, about the beginning, it's actually, uh, the, 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 we actually see using classical. A classical and machine learning algorithm. Now you want to know where, why, why should I, when should I go for a machine learning case or a deep learning case? So uh, ideally, you should actually learn these two things. You should learn the classical algorithm. When you tell, when you have a data, you have a problem, and you, you, you always should start with the classical ML first. Okay, does it? Does I do I have good performance based on this? If yes. Try the uh, deep learning. Do I have better performance with this? If no, then move move to the classical. If yes, then you could move to deep learning. So why I'm I'm saying this is because we should be, deep learning is successful, right? Sure, but uh, don't just ignore other kind of machine learning algorithms. Also, try to look at look at them also because they could be useful for your particular task. And also deep learning is essential in various high level applications in vision, that is working with images and videos, in language that work with texts, and in reinforcement learning, right? So uh, all this, so this, these are very high level applications and because of the uh, vast amount of data that we have with that, it's, deep learning is actually useful in that aspect. Um, so ideally, most, most of the times, so I think I would just say basically, probably my opinion based on experience is that we are working with vision and language. Uh, deep learning will definitely give you better performance, right? But of course, you should also try out new things. But when you're working with, let's say, some tabular data, like you want to do market segmentation, you want to do um, recommendation system, or you want to do some uh, typical things you do in machine learning, like uh, spam filtering. If you don't have large data, it's always advisable to actually go for to go for the classical ML. Right now. Deep learning is good, deep learning is all the way, it's successful, but we don't have deep understanding. So this, so Gary Marcos is one person in the field that has, uh, that's actually trying to critique deep learning. And he says something like, now we have the deep learning, so but we need deep understanding. And so this is why I'm saying this because it's actually in the future, like, so there, there are different things you could actually do to contribute even to, to the community. You could actually try to understand what goes on behind the scenes in deep learning, right? So deep understanding the research field entirely. Right. So uh, this year will be my conclusion. Uh, I will have will have a collab notebook. I will share it with organizers of this of this segment, of this uh, session. And um, so you will have you will have a. Few, so I know for now, but I'm not sure we've not covered much of the things in deep learning, right? So I won't, I won't, I won't delve more into, the, into my, I'm not delving into the technical things about deep learning, right? But uh, I will show, I will just show you kind of my deep learning. So the Kodak notebook would be more towards classical ML algorithms and then just like a, a, another deep learning approach to it, right? So. Um, yeah, so that is it. It's really nice to 
have it to have this discussion with you. So there are some, some of the references that we could look at. So, thank you very much, and um, looking forward to your questions and other interactions. Yeah, thank you so much, um, Jerry, for the very, very um, knowledgeable um, session. I was definitely able to add um, a knowledge or two, or in fact more, because um, lots of things that you said here are things that I typically overlook even while um, doing something general, trying to make decisions on the best approach to take for certain problem statements right from the onset. And uh, thank you so much for um, that. Um, uh, making such points out. And um, I think the, the um, do you have any general, okay, these are your conclusions, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, okay, okay, so um, um, thank you so much. So um, viewers, you can um, get to know more about um, Jerry, his website will be, we'll link to his website um, in the description, as well as his Twitter handle, so you can get to follow him and ask him questions. If you're watching this in the live session, Jerry will most likely be in the live session as well. That's the live, the watch party, that's the premiere. And boy, if you're, not, if you're watching this right after, you can always ask Jerry, shoot Jerry a question on Twitter and he will get to you. But um, I think this is where we end it. Um, but typically I would love to get a clarification from Jerry on, on of course, Gary Marcus. And um, I, I typically don't do research like more in the field. I'm more of a, more of a practicing um, practitioner than uh, on the research side of things, but I, I, I always enjoy the, the debate and the advancement in the space when it comes to um, the knowledgeable um, founding fathers and researchers talking about the problems with deep learning. And of course, one problem, like like we, we are teaching, we are currently, the practical machine learning course we are currently taking has to talk about, we are very, very keen on how systems can be explainable and deep learning systems are definitely not explainable. And Gary yeah, Marcus's, sure. yeah, and Gary Marcus's point, um, um, I'm, I'm going to get back to that, by the way. And Gary Marcus's point is all about you know, how we can, you know, have this hybrid for hybrid systems of deep learning and symbolic AI. Symbolic AI that, of course, worked in the past and, you know, and, and we had to dump it because now deep learning is doing all the work and it's doing the work. We don't know why it's doing the work <laughs> or it's surely working. So what's your, what's your thoughts on that explainability? Because it's something we are keen on for our students as well and our community members, explainability of deep learning systems. Where, where, where do you think it, 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 it's good enough that we trade performance for explainability? Because I think that's the trade of the, that, we, that often happens when it comes to how we can effectively explain how our deep learning systems make some certain choices or some certain decisions. Yeah, right. So, um... So as I said earlier, it's actually, it's actually a lot of people are actually looking in the, uh, it's actually research field entirely, right? Um, so first one thing, so people are taking different approaches, like people are, um, people are looking towards the um, theoretical side. So because the idea is once you get uh, a strong background, strong theoretical background, then it gets relatively easy to now to link it up to, to explainability. Other people are looking at it from uh, from on a different a different uh, from a different side. So, like trying to yeah. understand the bias that goes on within your deep learning models. So, try to visualize some layers of the network. Try to um, uh, maybe attack attack the models. Right. So, there are there are different technical approaches people are looking it into. But I think if if you want to go if you want to go delve into in the practical sense about um, Explainability in deep learning. I think uh, one advice I would just give is to look into some of the shelf uh, models that people are using. Right. So mm -hmm. there are a lot of open source articles like uh, like Sharp. Yeah, I think. Uh, let me Sharp see. Is, yeah. Yeah, I think Sharp. I think Sharp. Microsoft also has another one. Uh, I really can't really remember the name, but maybe if I if I do it, of course I can share. Um, so there are actually tools that that does this. So you could actually. So one of the good things to do to understand to give up this experiment in your deep learning model is to use these off the shelf tools, and it sort of like give you a visualization about. So, so why does this model predict that this uh, this this uh, this person has pneumonia and based on his checks extra and not not just it's just something else, right? So there are actually tools that will make you to visualize it. So there are also some. Um, there are also, also some, 
there are some, some work that is being done on, on using some probabilistic modeling based on, based, on some, based on your data, right? So actually now to show you. So there are different, different approaches that people are looking into, but it all comes down to the fact that as a practical person, you are just interested in the tool that people have developed right, to, to, to do this. So you could look towards the tools that people are using and Sharp is one, one example for, for explainability. Uh, yeah, because um, um, I, the reason why I'm saying so is because now that we have Africa advancing to, to a stage whereby I mean, we're not there yet for a stage whereby uh, we, uh, deep learning systems will pretty much be deployed in majority of the problems that plague our, our, our continent, at least for majority of those uh, um, more important problems. It has to do with how can we really explain how these systems will you know, um, explain their decisions. But yeah, we'll check, I, I think the viewers can check out Sharp. And um, I think what what if tool as as well. I guess what if tool from Google, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. That's the, that's yeah. yeah, that's deployed directly from. Um, you can also assess that directly from TensorBoard, which makes a lot of um, sense. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you so much again, Jerry, for your time, your consideration. And um, by the way, viewers, Jerry was. Jerry was like, he wasn't hesitant at all when we got to reach out to him. And it just shows the spirit of the community, the ML community. It's like, um, it's, it's one of the most, if not the best scientific community out there. And it's, it's really, really enlightening to see that such people are willing to um, give um, their time and, and their efforts to help support community causes and make sure their knowledge is accessible to anyone um, and democratized to people who otherwise wouldn't have access to such knowledge so thank you so much jerry once again we really appreciate you and um appreciate everything you. you're doing in fact and uh we hope to keep in touch with you and hope to see you um in nigeria sometime and maybe bring you down to potakos <laughs> where, where, where <laughs> it happens. i love you cool. <laughs> yeah, yeah yeah all right thank you so much jerry and thank you so much viewers um do check the description for any other details and stay safe bye bye